Hello and welcome um, to our expert talk. Um, today's topic is trade-based money laundering. Um, in an acronym, uh, it's called TBML. Uh, you saw it in the invitation. Um, and it's, I guess, a, a very interesting uh, topic um, as uh, I would say one third of the illicit money flows is related to uh, trade finance um, and uh, either it's money laundering within trade finance or uh, terrorist financing um, that can be used here. And um, as typically we have not only an interesting topic but also interesting uh, guests with us. Um, so uh, please welcome with me, first of all, uh, ladies first, Claudia Hussmann. Claudia is a former colleague of mine. He, she's a former partner at KPMG, uh, worked uh, lots of years in risk forensic. Um, a stressful job, uh, but you don't see it uh, um, in her face if you uh, uh, now uh, welcome her on stage. And Claudia, please um, uh, give us a short introduction about your profession, uh, professional career so far. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Claudia Huseman. As Dirk mentioned, I've worked in different areas. I was a banker as well in my first uh, part of my career. I've been in financial services and consulting, AML compliance consulting for over 30 years now. So um, I love it. It's challenging, keeps changing, new regulations. So it makes it all exciting. And I look forward to talk about trade-based money laundering today. Great, thank you, Claudia. Um, uh, next on the stage, um, uh, Sebastian Seitz. Um, I met him during a crypto session. Uh, it was about crypto um, currencies, actually, but also uh, about, um, let's say, DLT. And, and he's a real uh, expert, and um, um, he will be joining us uh, to give us uh, some insights about smart contracts, how smart contracts can be used uh, for trade finance, and what that can mean for fighting uh, money laundering, uh, for example, but also terrorist financing. Um, Sebastian, please, a um, uh, few words on you. Yes, thank you. My name is Sebastian Seitz. I'm CEO of IQS. Um, we are in a consultancy specialized on innovative technologies, especially in the AI and uh, blockchain space. I'm a kind of uh, blockchain early adopter. I started my first project in 2015. And um, yeah, I'm very glad to be part of this. Perfect, thank you. Then our third guest, um, he's our principal business consultant within MSG Rethink Compliance. Please welcome Uwe Weber. And Uwe, um, also maybe a short introduction on your person. Thank you, Dirk. Yeah, hello from my side. My name is Uwe Weber. I'm a former money laundering officer. I worked for more than 15 years in consultancy services. Yeah, and I have done a lot of projects yeah, as well about trade finance. Yeah, and I'm glad to join this session. Perfect, thank you. So last one um, on stage is me, myself and I, uh, so Dirk Findeisen, um, one of the ground, uh, one of the founders uh, and managing uh, partner uh, within MSG Rethink Compliance. Um, I'm uh, within regulatory anti-financial crime compliance uh, for nearly 15 years now, um, so um, some sort of experience um, on a global stage here. Um, a few words on this format. Um, as you know, uh, Expert Talks is a series of uh, discussions uh, uh, we bring in typically on a monthly base. Um, so if you um, get interested in this one, uh, feel free um, to, to join us and follow us um, um, on MSG Rethink Compliance um, or hashtag Rethink Compliance. Um, but also, as we know, I have a few experts sitting here where we um, have this discussion for the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes, um, but I know that uh, lots of experts are um, uh, joining us um, in the audience um, and um, you might want to uh, get your comments uh, to us uh, or send us your questions, uh, just use uh, the chat functionality to do so. We try typically to uh, pick them up and uh, um, have uh, them inserted into our discussion as best as possible. It's not always possible for all of them, but uh, at least you have a, a chance to discuss with us. Okay, so um, let's get this discussion um, starting. Um, if we talk about new technologies and trade-based money laundering, maybe we should 
talk about trade-based money laundering, and if we talk about trade-based money laundering, we might need to discuss about trade finance uh, at all. So um, maybe, uh, so Claudia, Uwe, maybe you want to give us a, a short impression about what kind of volumes are we talking about? So why is trade finance uh, that important? And what kind of a role plays money laundering or terrorist financing within the trade finance processes? Okay, um, I think we could bring up the slide with the statistics just to give the audience a little bit, but I'm not going to spend much time on this. Uh, according to the World Trade Organization, its members exported merchandise totaling over $2 trillion, of which about $2 trillion is estimated to be involved with money laundering transactions. And as we all know, if we've been in this industry long enough, uh, money laundering is a very profitable business for the criminals, and uh, it's not the bank's role to uh, confirm that a crime has been committed. Banks just need to monitor, need to prevent, need to make sure that they don't accept clients who are um, bad characters or just, uh, you know, prevention is the key. But once you have a customer and they're involved, they have an export business or an import business, they're going to most likely approach the banks and ask about trade financing to support transactions. The type of structure or the type of instrument that you would use would depend on the relationship between the two, but the buyer and the seller, obviously, because uh, about 80% of all trade financing is actually done on an open account. And most of the involvement there would be perhaps with the payment um, behind the trade uh, uh, trade financing transaction. So the bank would only affect a payment. But uh, the most popular instrument, though, tends to be the letters of credit. So there you have the applicant that goes to their bank, asks for a letter of credit. And it really is for the purpose of minimizing the risk of non-payment for that particular party. So it really depends on the level of participation by the bank in terms of how they're involved, what they need to be looking for, what their obligations are to report any unusual or suspicious activity. At the end of the day, trade-based money laundering and Uber chime in, you know, it's really no different the definition of money laundering than it is the general money laundering. What you're trying to do is disguise the proceeds of a crime and you're moving goods or value, in essence, it's really money at the end of the day because the seller wants to be paid for the goods that they've exported and the importer takes title of the goods. And it's really to just attempt to disguise the legit or to, to make an attempt to legitimize the origins, right? The illicit origins. These are criminal activities that you're trying to make look like they're um, real transactions, uh, real merchandise, because we also know about phantom shipping, where actually no goods ever get shipped. So there's a lot of different things, and you need to just understand what structure you're dealing with and then what the level of involvement for the bank is. Uwe, I don't know if you want to I, add. I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you, Claudia, and thank you yeah, for this for this screen because we can see it's a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, it is nothing which happens only in the United States. Yeah where they uh, say black market peso exchange, for, for example, yeah, for the drug traffic from Mexico. Yeah, I've, I've worked yeah, in, in Southeast Asia. Yeah, there it's, it's very popular and common. Yeah, and I was as well in Africa. Yeah, and we have seen yeah, all these animals yeah, which were part of trade finance uh, illegal activities. And it is a phenomenon yeah, where it starts with the contract yeah, and later on. Yeah, the payments, yeah, this is the latest stage. Yeah, it is it is important to understand the risk, yeah, the risk of the contract, yeah, and the risk, yeah, of uh, the activities the client is doing in. Yeah, so I absolutely agree with you, and I think we are still, yeah, we are still not able to identify all, yeah, all activities for the moment because new typologies comes on the on the page every time. If you look on the on the on, on the statistics, and that's what I, I think is very um, um, impressive, is the huge amount uh, that is used for illicit uh, uh, money flows. Um, uh, so, in comparison to the whole volume of the trade, uh, so typically you think about that two to five percent um, um, in regards to the GDP, uh, the worldwide GDP is related to um, illicit money flows. Um, so within uh, uh, trade finance, obviously, the ratio is, uh, is even better for the organized crime guys and for the uh, professional money launderies. 
as a profession at all, um, as you know, and, and obviously uh, you can earn um, lots of money, but um, you're always in danger to have the wrong uh, partners on, on your side dealing with. Um, nevertheless, why is it that easy um, to use um, trade finance uh, uh, to bring in your illicit uh, money, uh, to place it um, and to uh, yeah, um, be successful in doing that? Why is it so hard to get it identified? So um, what are your option, or opinions about that? I mean, from my perspective, it's because you can hide within the goods. I think we've all seen even um, stories uh, uh, from discovered cases that uh, drugs were melted into, put into the base of a lamp and something. So there's a lot of volume, first of all. And the customs agents at the borders can't look at every single container that comes into the countries. And I think the volumes have increased much more. I'm not even sure if two trillion is the correct number. That's only what has been reported, investigated, and identified, but I guarantee you that it's a lot more than the 10% of the 22 million that's actually money laundering. It's just not discovered or made known. Plus you have a lot of parties involved in the transactions, right? Um, the issuing bank, the advising bank, the confirmation bank, you have the shipping companies, you may have intermediaries, you have the applicant, you know, so you have the export importer. So there's so many layers of everything. And let's face it, the shipping industry in itself is a very layered from the ownership who stands behind the ships and all that. And then the banks also have to worry about a lot of regulations. So you have the uniform commercial code uh, and international standards that regulate letters of credit and those things. But you also have AM, you know, anti-money laundering regulations. You have sanctions regulations. You need to be aware of bribery and corruption. You need to be aware of customs, maybe avoidance of customs duties um, and taxations and things like that. So there's a lot of things that are layered in when you're looking mm -hmm. at financing and the more complexity there is the easier i think it's for the criminals to influx that market most you know drug lords have export import companies they all look legit on paper they can put a front man that looks legitimate when you investigate them but they're really driving the organization and they're driving what goes on those containers with the luck that the customs will not um, look at every single container that's come in. And the way we're looking at it, if everybody remembers the Suez Canal where that big container ship got stuck, the ships are getting bigger, which means more goods are being exported. And at the end of the day, um, it just can't all be looked at. So it's very simple mm -hmm. to look at that. And then documentation but, can but be simplified too. Yeah, that, that, that would mean... Uh, it's the old game. As more complex uh, the business is or the deal is and the structure is, uh, it's better to hide illicit money um, in that, illicit structures, uh, structures and um, as harder it is to detect it. Is that true? I, I yes. would say yes, I sure, Uwe, um, you have a thought about yes, thank that. You, thank well. you, Claudia. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you and it's quite difficult yeah, uh, to, to analyze those things yeah, from the banking perspective yeah, because the compliance teams, uh, from the understanding of the management, most of the time is a cost center. Yeah, and the question is all the time, yeah, why you investigate those contracts? This is a good client and so on. Yeah, so there must be a, a, a huge motivation, yeah, to jump in those fields and inform at, at least the management to say it is necessary and it's worth. Yeah? And the other point is, yeah, when, when we see yeah, what, what the auditors are doing, yeah, the auditors check, yeah, if you have done all the reports, the CTR yeah, and the CBWTR and so on, yeah, but trade finance, it is quite complex. So you cannot have only a risk matrix and say, okay, it's this and this and this, and now it's fine. Yeah? You have to, to understand as well, yeah, what, what is the purpose yeah, of this deal, yeah? why you are doing this deal, yeah, and why yeah, you are doing this contract. Yeah? And then we have this enormous volumes yeah, of goods which are shipped, yeah? and if you are sick, sitting, as a banker in your office, it is quite difficult. You have to do it active and not only passive. Mm. Yes, discussing uh, those topics with uh, different FIUs also. Um, so FIUs are financial um, um, investigation units, um, as you might know, uh, financial intelligence uh, units. And um, they um, 
they're struggling uh, with, uh, let's say, cross-border um, information um, exchange, which is um, always an issue. Um, and of course, it's an issue um, in, in trade financing, as uh, those deals are global deals typically, or intercontinental deals, mm. uh, makes it even harder uh, um, for, for, for them to investigate as well. Um, good. Uh, got this one, understood yes, this one. One, one uh, point, one point more, yeah. Dirk, yeah, because you yeah. discussed with the FIU. Yeah, so a lot of FIUs are using GoAML, yeah, but the focus for GoAML is transaction monitoring, yeah. But we are we are talking here about contract monitoring, yeah, which is definitely something you have to insert manually in the GoAML application. And then you need from the FIU side experts in those areas like trade finance yeah, to understand yeah, why the bank is doing those reports. So I think yeah, this is a, as, as well a lack of understanding or let's say a deep understanding must, must be better. Yeah, to so is if, if yeah, I agree, but if I would be the FIU, I would uh, I, I would uh, pin this one back to you and, and would say, okay, just provide me uh, um, high quality reports um, um, and then I can get all the information that I need to uh, get it aligned with my colleagues in the other FIU and the other countries uh, that are involved in this deal and um, can get a better image and a better, um, um, so get my puzzle um, done. But, um, but so, that note of the data privacy, while true, I think the banks to prevent is really to know the customer and talk to their customers and understand when they're an export import company, who their customers are, what markets they serve, who are their traditional um, traditional suppliers, or who do they buy from. Get that information. Understand the nexus to sanctions mm -hmm. countries right um understand what the corru corruption levels understand if that country has weak aml um, regulations and enforcement and other things before you even accept the client but then also the bank should be looking at the other banks involved in the transaction um to make sure that they're comfortable with dealing that bank i mean in the us i know that when you're repeatedly dealing with the same advising bank, essentially the, the bank is also going to do due diligence on that bank and get a comfort level on that bank, right? And then as Uwe pointed out, yes, the transaction monitoring, you can set up rules, but that's always after the fact. And, and unless you have very astute people during the documentary review that find things where they can report the stuff, the transactions already occurred the minute the letter of credit is advised. So at that point in time, it's all about identifying unusual activity and reporting such activity. So you really need the knowledgeable people. But at the end of the day, and the transaction monitoring systems come after the fact, You, the strength is more in the people that are, are looking at the documentary evidence to make sure that a and b and c add up and that you know there are certain things that they can do to look mm -hmm. at like the price of the commodity the value but that's not foolproof either because you don't know if the buyer uh, if the seller is giving a discount to the um, buyer there could be other circumstances you know so there could be other things that that in and itself may not be unusual or suspicious mm -hmm. so it, it kind of becomes a, a a web but the most important role the bank has if they think there's something unusual they just have to report it to the relevant mm. authorities so i, I take with me, with me uh complexity uh, documents meaning unstructured information somehow maybe it's not that unstructured as we all think about but it's it's a sort of unstructured information and of course the knowledge about the deals you mentioned um the inco terms and and, and all the other stuff that someone um, um, in the bank needs to understand, needs to know to really evaluate uh, whether the deal is a correct one, um, can be fine, what is the risk coming with it, and so on and so on. So, but I guess typically um, uh, meeting those guys in the banks, uh, they really understand the business. They, they sometimes understand the business <laughs> even better than uh, uh, the producers and the importers um, or exporters uh, themselves. Um, but nevertheless, okay, take this uh, with me, and that's fine. But um, as we, we, we said, there are multiple layers uh, involved in, in, in a, a trade finance uh, deal. Uh, maybe it's worth to um, have a short explanation why uh, this is the fact and um, how different banks need to work together um, um, and so on. So maybe we can have a, a look on the next slide, please. And, uh, um, Uber, Claudia, whoever might uh, be the one, uh, just give us a short explanation. Um, how 
such a trade finance life cycle is look like and where we always need to 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 let's say have to investigate have to evaluate uh, whether it's um, a problem or not whether there is a risk or not uh uva would you like to start or do you want me to start no start, start and let me let me talk about the mt and so on okay yeah. so I mean, this is a very simplistic um, dem uh, graphic of how a tr uh, trade transaction would occur. Obviously, the first thing is you need a seller and a buyer. So you need somebody who's selling something to the buy uh, to somebody who's importing the goods. So we have uh, at that point in time, they want to enter into agreement. Now, whether or not they require a letter of credit would depend again on the relationship between the buyer and the producer so let's assume that um, to minimize the risk of non-payment the buyer does want a letter of credit so the buyer will then go to his bank depicted as bank b in this diagram and ask for a letter of credit to be opened up the letter of credit will contain details um about the buyer about um, the exporter, uh, if there are specific uh, ports involved, uh, intermediaries involved, what the goods are that are being shipped, there'll be enough information on there. The bank will review and either say, yep, you're good to go with the letter of credit. If they're fine with that, then usually they send a notification to bank A or to the producer directly. So the bank B could be notifying the producer directly, but usually it's done through an advising bank. That advising bank may also be acting as a confirming bank. Um, they will let the producer know that they received this letter of credit um, so that the producer can then make sure that the shipment of goods um, is, is uh, taken care of. So the export itself is taken care of. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, if it's documentary, those documents get reviewed by the bank, they look at it, and if everything is in order, a payment will be made. Now, it's a very simplistic uh, graphic. There are a lot more complications. You can have changes to a letter of credit. You can have partial shipments. Uh, there could be lots of different reasons um, and makes it much more complex. You could also transfer the LC to somebody else. So there could be a lot more complexity, but this is a very simplistic graphic of what that is. Obviously, the risks differ depending on which role you are and on what you're in uh, and whether or not documentary credit is used uh, you know, so you have documents against payment or you have documents against acceptance. Those are the two different types of documentary collections you could have within this world. Um, you, the vessel needs to, you know, you have your screening obligations. You have to screen the vessel as well. We've had OFAC cases where the institution got into trouble because they weren't screening the vessel. Uh, shipping industry is famous for renaming vessels. And also where the ships are incorporated tend to be higher risk jurisdictions as well. So there's all sorts of layers. And I remember when we were got hired by a bank um, to look for bribery within letters of credit, uh, you need to understand what intermediaries involved, how they're involved, why they are part of that transaction, because you could potentially be paying a bribe to an official uh, or to a party um, to get them to do certain things and, and make something happen. So um, that's a very simplistic explanation. I said this can get a lot more complex in it. Uva, I'm sure you're somewhere it's a, it's, here. It's, it's a very good and understandable screen, Claudia. Thank you for sharing this, yeah, because this uh, gives us an idea about the problems. Yeah, when we are talking about the Swift 700s, yeah, so we know, yeah, we, we have unstructured data, yeah, so it is very, very difficult, yeah. To, to get the right feedback about those things, yeah, and in a swift message, yeah, uh, to include those things in a transaction monitoring tool is is quite difficult because it doesn't include any customer number, yeah, so it's just the number of the contract typically, yeah, and this makes it so difficult, yeah, to um, to implement those things, those payments and messages, yeah, in a transaction monitoring tool, yeah, to create complex scenarios to help banks. And compliance officer, yeah, uh, to to get an output from an automated system because, yeah, this these are the points that the data is unstructured. 
Yeah, mm. and the other things, yeah, the other things are out of the box. Yeah, you have to check those things. Yeah, for example, you have a risk matrix or something like this. Yeah, before you open, yeah, the letter of credit. Yeah, because as soon, yeah, as you send the letter of credit to the to the uh, producer, yeah, so you you guarantee that the money will flow. Yeah, and this is definitely a, as well a credit risk for the bank. Yeah, and who want to lose money? Mm. Um. Absolutely. So, um, what is uh, besides the complexity, besides unstructured data um, um, and the knowledge about um, the dependencies here, uh, it's also uh, my understanding about lots of data uh, to screen against, um, as I heard from Claudia and also from you, Uber. Um, so there's 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 uh, also some uh, some more uh, let's say technology that can be used here uh, to get at least those topics maybe. Uh, a little bit um, easier to be to be handled. Uh, we'll come to this um, quite well. There was one question um, when we uh, discussed about um, open account activities, um, um, and there are at least um, two questions that are more or less the same, um, asking um, how how a bank uh, can monitor um, open account activities, um, especially if there are no transport documents in, in, in place, for example, um, um, performer invoices or, or something like this. Um, so uh, what would be your uh, recommendation, your advice um, um, on that question? At least your answer on that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you need expert, yeah, and you need some strict processes and policies, yeah, how to investigate in those things, yeah, and as well, it makes definitely sense, yeah, to uh, to make a review and an analysis, yeah, from from time to time, yeah, with um, with, with 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 a deep deep knowledge what is necessary, yeah, and the the question is what is the consequence if yeah the transport documents, for example, are pro forma. Uh, documents yeah so yeah you, you you need as well the motivation yeah as well to cancel some relationships yeah it is it's quite difficult yeah and if you see all the activities the compliance team has to do yeah mm. this is this is one of the additional topics but you need time for this but it's definitely a good invest yeah to have a to have a risk matrix yeah and have a to to have an audit on those things from time to time so okay. I would add to Uber that besides the compliance, having like an assurance program where they test and look at things. Um, when I was an auditor, the third line of defense, your internal audit should be also testing. So we would pull random payments because a lot of times, remember these payments when they're an open account, they may not be any reference of any kind. It's simply a payment and you don't really know if there's a trade financing transaction behind it. But if you know that your customer is in the export import business, most likely um, he's either receiving a payment because he sold goods or if he's the importer, he has to make a payment. So um, audit should be testing and, and taking uh, from, from the payments, pick random amounts and, and test. And I can tell you that when we used to do the audits, we would find things and we would say, this looks to be a trade transaction based on the knowledge of your customer. We know that they're in that export import. And then we would ask for documents. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if it's a foreign bank that has U.S. operations, they're just the intermediary making the settlement in U.S. dollars, which is also another layer of complexity because now you also have to worry about OFAC. And again, there's been lots of cases where um, the banks still get penalized, even though the letter of credit was not within the US, but the payment was in US dollars. And the minute it becomes a US dollar payment, OFAC comes into play. So we found that when we asked for the documents, not only did we find that it was an illegal trade with a sanctioned country in the US, so I was dealing with the foreign bank here, but it violated OFAC. So at that point in time, it becomes a self-reporting, it becomes an automatic penalty and all these other things. So your internal audit department also should be testing and looking at that. And they should be looking at customer types when they're doing their testing to look at, uh, at the greater risk customers. And those would include people in the trade finance and the export import business. Mm. Let's keep in mind, trade financing is typically a very short term nature, right? The financing is not a very long term in nature because it's really to facilitate the import or export of a trade. You can have some longer term one to five year when it's more maybe equipment or um, 
uh, more expensive type of merchandise, but the average trade financing deal is probably 180 days or less, 270 days or less. Um, and then you have the complexity also of dual goods, right? Where the bank does not necessarily know if it's used by the military or governments or for personal use. So um, some banks have policies where they will not be involved with nuclear equipment or military type of equipment. They even shy away from financing helicopters because there is that potential risk that it could get in the wrong hands, especially when the export of the country where there's political instability or active um, terrorist cells and things like that. So it can become a matter of setting the right policy, having the right controls in place, but you need to test for this and then you look behind it. Um, so I've heard people say, well, why don't you just ask for every payment? You ask for proof. And I said, well, then no payment would ever go out because the amount of payments that are processed, there's no way you can ask for detailed proof behind every single mm -hmm. payment. So it really comes down to having a good, strong quality assurance within the compliance area and a strong audit that's looking at this and based on customers that are in that export import field, picking um, random payments and, and looking and asking for the documents behind. I mean, I looked at it also, in this example, I looked at what branches were sending from the head office, um, you know, from, from, from the entity. I said, oh, they're in a nexus to a sanctioned OFAC country. So I want to pick some payments that came from that branch um, and look at the payments and then look. So, you know, as an auditor, you can use a lot of different risk variables and mm. do your selection for sampling. And uh, how, how would you, how would you, you have your experience um, 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 doing forensics um, in this uh, topic and this domain as well. So how would you um, advise customers uh, to deal with how to get the right um, samples, at least for a quality check um, later on to see um, whether uh, the decision making around those deals were done the right way or how to improve the system? Um, meaning the organization as well as the monitoring and screening systems uh, to come up with a, with a, a proper system that triggers uh, uh, the right alerts. I, there's lots of layers to that question, but obviously you have to look at the overall volumes that they do. You know, how much letters of credit volume do they do? What's the payment volume? Um, what are the markets their where their clients sitting in? Um, well, can you can you, for example, just say, uh, just give me only the transactions and based on the transactions, like uh, uh, tax investigators are doing it. Uh, uh, just look on the trans on, on on the transactions. Say, okay, uh, there are some that are let's say suspicious because they are different to uh, all the other ones. Um, can you can you just have a look on on those trade financing transactions only, and then? pick the ones um, that are highly um, um, suspicious only by, let's say, uh, using statistics uh, um, and, okay. and uh, maybe a sort of a machine learning model uh, behind? Absolutely. I think machine learning can be um, applied uh, to the whole process. So it's a multi-layer. What we would do, I would ask for clients who have um, a trade financing facility from a credit perspective. So I would ask for credit, give me a list of all the clients that have a trade financing facility that have done uh, letters of credit, export import financing, that have done standby letters of credit. So I get that detail. Then I get the payments details. I try to align the two and try to figure out. Then also you get the account details so that you're looking at all different numbers and trying to see if you can just see on that, if you can see something already, and then you dig through it and ask for further documentation to support that. Then you get to know your customer files to look at information that they've collected at the customer. Do they really know who they're dealing with? Did they ask the right questions at, at the account opening, which I can tell you a lot of banks still don't like to ask the right questions. and and go back to the customers. And I think a lot of times it's also that the front office or the business or the relationship office haven't been trained on what to look for or what to ask. Um, so there's a lot of layers. And then of course, it depends on, on management and the board uh, in terms of uh, their oversight and involvement and challenging and supporting 
the compliance and risk function sufficiently mm. to be able to do this, as well as internal audit. I mean, I've seen in my years where internal audit gets uh, basically disregarded that, you know, those are all people who, who just are there and their necessity, but they don't take them seriously. And we all know that that can lead to huge enforcement actions when the banks don't take the internal audit. But that also assumes that people are well-trained and know what to look for. Yeah, you think that there's really, um, let's say, a sort of a guidance out there um, um, about how to, to handle um, trade finance in uh, in regards to money laundering activities and terror, terrorist financing. Um, because, um, see, I'm, I'm 15 years in this business, you are um, even longer um, here, but um, looking on the literature, whether it's FATF, whether uh, um, it's from, 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 from other institutes um, or, um, let's say, regulators, I guess uh, the guidance, um, the typologies, uh, uh, the red flags, uh, information and so on, is, let's say, relatively poor in regards to the volume of illicit money that uh, goes through trade finance. Um, but um, at least, I guess, 2020, there was um, 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 a publication from FATF together with the Eggman Group right. um, talking about, um, uh, I guess, it was uh, about trends and developments in trade-based money laundering. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with that one. Uh, what are the trends um, and are those trends stable or are they, let's say, each two years different or, or however? Uh, what's your opinion about that? Because that's also important to, uh, at, at least if you have a system uh, that is triggering alerts, um, it's also important um, how often you have to calibrate the system, whether you can it calibrate or whether you always have to reset it, it uh after a while because of new findings in the market? I mean, there, there have been different trends, but to me, the underlying trade financing, much has not changed, right? Now, whether it's- well, that's the good news. Or, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's a structure, right? There's documents, there's things you have to look at, but I think it's also volatility. It's also how well uh, the prosperity of a country is in terms of whether the exporter is comfortable with open account or whether they insist on a letter credit. So there are fluctuations in terms of volumes over the years because it depends on the market. It depends on the prosperity of the country, the trust in the relationship between the parties that are selling. But the underlying transaction hasn't changed. And uh, actually, FATF and the Eggman Group did an update in March 21, all the related risk factors. So when you look at trade documents and commodity risk, they provide a list of risk factors or trade activity risk, uh, structural entity risk, and account and transaction activity risk. So they did a really good job in this document, just focuses on those red flags. And when I looked at it, I, I'm like, this is no different than what we were looking at back in the 90s. Um, so I don't think the underlying thing, I think it's it's a fluctuation depending on the tides, but I think what helps also to understand if, if I'm working in a, in a uh, letters of credit department or I'm working as a transaction monitoring analyst, it's also understanding the relationships between the country, the history between those countries in terms of exportation, importation of goods, what type of goods move between those countries, um, that can also help. And that's part of training or just having the experience experience when you've been in the market long enough and then you start seeing the same players and you start seeing the same parties now i can tell you that when i worked at barclays in miami covering latin america we found out that one of the exporters was in argentina was double or triple invoicing for the same transaction going to three mm -hmm. different banks and financing their transaction three times which of course is fraudulent but that's one of the things um factors that you wouldn't know as a bank unless you have very good relationship with the other banks in that country and you have contacts in those compliance departments or the bankers and you can talk to them. We just found out by talking that the exporter asked for the same financing from bank A and another bank and from us. And we're all like, okay, this is unusual, a bit suspicious. So a lot of times, as you said, I think earlier, it's the connection also and, and being able to allowed to talk to others now the data privacy becomes a problems but governments are becoming more open 
to me, what I find the most interesting to learn about trends is whenever a government has uncovered a case and they do their demonstration or they write a paper about how they come about, how they investigate it. I think there's a lot of things in there that the banks can learn from more so than what I see in the trends uh, and development, because to me, it's just a lot of common sense. And I don't, I, to me personally, it hasn't changed that much. The risk indicators are the similar, but we are getting better with technology and keeping a focus on the technology, fine tuning that technology to make sure that you are screening all the relevant fields, all the relevant SWIFT messages. And then of course, as Sebastian is gonna talk about the contract systems um, that can also facilitate and being able to screen contracts with keywords and pick up, you know, there's a lot more technology that can add, be added into the mix. Yeah, I, I, I saw Sebastian, uh, um, he was not really uh, participating in this discussion so far, so we need to bring him in now. Uh, it's a quite good moment uh, because I need to challenge you a little bit, Claudia, because you said it's uh, quite stable, um, it's still uh, the same. But uh, I think um, um, when I had a discussion with Sebastian about cryptocurrencies, um, uh, my, my opinion about cryptocurrencies and uh, uh, the transparency of the ledger, um, it, it's quite a topic uh, by its own. So it's um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not that optimistic uh, than others uh, about this one, but uh, I think that uh, DLT, uh, so blockchain um, as a technology layer, is quite interesting. And the first topic I had, I guess, a few years ago, I said, okay, this technology might be worth uh, to elaborate for trade financing issues. And the first... Uh, uh, trade finance platforms came uh, across uh, based on the ledger, based on DLT. Um, and Sebastian, uh, maybe you can give us a short um, information about how a smart contract um, is working um, and what the benefit um, of a smart contract is, especially for trade finance. Yes. Yeah, so the main idea is uh, to, to uh, use smart contracts as a kind of yeah, uh, documentation for the uh, underlying process. So we have a kind of shared database uh, where all participants have access to, and we have a kind of uh, yeah, immutable, uh, immutable share, shared history of uh, all the events that actually happened there. To Claudia, to, to, to pick up your example of uh, multiple uh, payments for the same invoice, yeah. um, this would be a very easy way to, to, to prevent because yeah, you see, okay, this is the invoice, you see it has been paid, and then there's no reason to pay it, uh, to pay it another time. Yeah? So, um, that's the main idea. So speaking about smart contracts, it's always a little bit confusing because of the word contract in it. It's less than a yeah, formal legal contract. It's more like an, yeah, let's call it state machine, yeah, where you have certain states with uh, yeah, well-defined transitions uh, with a rule set uh, who can trigger a transition and under which yeah, conditions would have been fulfilled in the front. And um, uh, you can think about yeah, a process, yeah, as we've seen on the slide before, um, yeah, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole process from from ordering the good, shipping the good, and actually doing payment. Um, yeah, you can model this in a smart contract. It's a kind of computer application that runs decentralized on a blockchain. And um, yeah, and the main idea is just to create a single source of truth for all participants. Mm -hmm. So, but um, so my humble opinion about that one. So a, a smart contract is always something that uh, uh, you program uh, because it's code at the end. Uh, you program it on the um, 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 in a, in a, on a specific moment in time where every uh, one agrees. Um, but then, and then during um, the whole trade is going on, situations are happening. So reality meets the plan. Uh, let's call it that way. Um, and from my understanding, a smart contract cannot be changed. So papers can be adopted, there can be an amendment uh, sent to a contract, uh, which makes it not easier, but at, at least the deal can be uh, uh, modified and can be, uh, um, let's say, processed. But how about a, 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 a smart contract? How about changing an existing smart contract? Would it be uh, done through an additional smart contract, would you modify the existing smart contract? What would be uh, uh, the way to do it in a compliant way? Yeah, that's a code is law argument. Um, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I think we have to differentiate here a little bit between public and private blockchain. So in public blockchains, it's indeed a problem because um, yeah, you have to be sure that uh, nobody is changing the rules afterwards. In private blockchains, it's a little bit more easier because uh, at the end, uh, your business part partners are interacting with each, each other and at the end, uh, you can sue them. So um, there's no need for the absolutely automatic enforcement on chain yeah so there you have more 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 room for flexibility let's say like this uh, here um but in your specific example it doesn't matter because what you are doing is you don't changing the rules of the contract you just uh yeah it's, it's just it's just changing the uh, actual process that's executed by the contract so at the end it's well, what what would happen of course you can change uh, the conditions of, of the deal but um what is important is uh, just to monitor it, make it transparent. Yeah, you can change your price or your delivery time or whatever. Yeah, but um, it has to be transparent. Yeah? It does not mean that everything we, we agree uh, in the first the first hand has to be set in stone. It's just yeah, it's just yeah, important to 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 monitor it, and you can 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 uh, yeah can can see every change that had been made in the deal parameters. So um, mm. I don't think it's a problem in this case. I mean, you're, uh, let's say, more or less, um, uh, just just a question, maybe also to, to Claudia and Uwe. Uh, would it be possible to have a whole trade finance um, agreement settled only based on, on, on smart contracts without paperwork, without other documents, just smart contracts? Did you saw something like this um, going around or? Yeah, as a kind of piece. Or is it, is it just only, is it just only, let's say, a vehicle? Um, that is used besides the document work that is um, um, still needed uh, because you uh, might need your customs declarations, you might need those papers for that arbor, for that ship, um, and, and so on. So I'm, 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 I'm always thinking about it, it, it would be an easy world if everything is homogeneous, available, and can be done all through a smart contract. But is that really the reality? And if not, will we develop? into such a reality in the future, in the near future or whenever? Um, or um, would the advice still be, uh, um, if we're using uh, technology, um, get the unstructured information um, somehow structured, get, uh, let's say, the entity uh, resol the entities resolved out of those text information um, and get it handed over um, um, into, um, let's say, a graph database or um, um, a link database where you can, uh, let's say, get everything together in a way that um, it's easy for you to analyze it and, and generate alert and red flags out of that. Um, what's your opinion about that? And it's not only for Sebastian. Obviously, Sebastian is the technology expert here, but... Um, but, but uh, uh, I can start. Yeah? I think DLT and blockchain technology could be could be a way to achieve this. But at the end, in the perfect world, what would happen? We'd, I think... It, doesn't matter if we set up these technologies because at the end we need uh, we need uh, connected systems. Yeah, so and you can use blockchain technology as a kind of uh, yeah a glue between these systems, a kind of uh, independent layer that everybody can connect to. But on the other hand, uh, it's not it's not for free. Yeah, so so blockchain technology is it's really famous for being inefficient. Yeah, it's, you have some privacy issues you have to uh, yeah you have to look at. So uh, I don't think it's a silver bullet you just use and have a, a, a profitable damage. Yeah? So um, yeah, it's just a tool. Yeah? And if you do it in the right way, then um, it can be really helpful. Yeah? It can be really helpful because it's a very easy way to uh, connect people uh, uh, that you're yeah, just, just, just uh, for a certain kind of standard. Yeah? And you make kind of open network, you make a kind of open shared, data, shared database. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main advantage. But all mm. the other problems, yeah, unstructured mm. data and, and uh, paper-based documents, you have to solve anyway. And there's really blockchain technology cannot help you. Yeah? It's just make mm. more transparent and immutable. Yeah, the now, you're just, now, now you're destroying dreams of any <laughs> um, <laughs> easy <laughs> way to get it solved. <laughs> and um, also the dreams, I guess, from uh, some of the uh, DLT investors um, as well. But maybe as long as it's uh, <clears throat> as, as 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 it's not done, um, it's, uh, or as long as you think it's uh, impossible, it's just not done. So it's far. not. Um, yeah, it's we'll not see. done. So far, right, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Um, the, the Ooh, I, I agree with you, yeah, but but you know, yeah, that criminals find 
every time a new way yeah and they will use these new new technologies and at the moment yeah we are fighting with the old technologies to find an efficient way yeah to fight against trade based money laundering yeah and to bring it yeah on on the paper yeah or, or for discussion is uh, so the Wolfsberg group created two years ago an, an excellent questionnaire about correspondent banking yeah and perhaps yeah if those experts do the same for for trade finance, yeah, for for the for the contracts and so on, yeah, that we have a questionnaire and perhaps an automated questionnaire which will check all the necessary fields and so on, yeah, and then you get a qualitative result, yeah. This will help banks and this will help compliance units, and then we can talk about smart contracts. Yeah, yeah this is my view. Story. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, to me, you know, blockchain chase and, and the larger banks have been exploring right. blockchain for many different areas of banking and, and the services and how to tie together. But the cost involved, if you're dealing with a branch of a foreign bank or a smaller bank, they're not going to necessarily put that much money into uh, a sophisticated technology and all of that. Uh, most of the clients I dealt with, when it came to letters of credit, they were relying still on the humans. While they might have a letter of credit system of some kind, it wasn't the smart contract or anything. Some people were testing around smart contracts, but it was, again, the larger banks that will put more money towards technology. Now, if it were up to the shareholders or the board of directors, isn't there some magical system that can do all of this and find all of this without needing all those humans uh, and the human intellect to put the points together? Um, the, the checklist aspect, um, Uwe, that you spoke about, the corresponding qu questionnaire, uh, I've used that and expanded it for many clients to go into much more detail than what was originally developed. And I agree. I think it can be a good training tool as well. If somebody sat down and really developed it a little bit, what things you need to look for without making it overly complex. But can technology help? Absolutely. Um, but you also need to make sure you have people who know how to do and, and cryptocurrency to your point, dear, that would just be on the payment side of it. Right. So then you're dealing with wallets and, and you need to get information from another three big cryptocurrency exchanges to bring that into your transaction monitoring system. But then you're really just looking at the payment side of that. So is there a magical system? No. Is there technology that can be used to further and improve? Yes. But Going back to my original point, it doesn't change the nature of the underlying transactions and how those, mm -hmm. work, right? Even if you had a smart contract or you had a shared database like they did with hedge funds and things where you could look up, uh, pull down a hedge fund prospectus and uh, other documents in order to verify that the hedge fund is legitimate. You still don't know if it's a counterfeit invoice. You still don't know if there were actual goods shipped and that's not the bank's role. The bank is not looking at every good Right. They're looking at papers and trusting that those papers are in order and just looking to make sure there um, there aren't any unusual signs or red flags in that whole transaction and putting it together from different points of data that they've gathered. But the criminals will produce any type of document you need. They pay for people to be in their pockets. You know, so it's like if you close the door here and I think Uber said that, then they'll find some other way to create a different diversion or other things. A lot of shell companies get created as part of this, right? And mm -hmm. there's no real substance behind them. Um, the phantom shipping, the short shipping, the long shipping, there are so many different things that you need to understand that I think for a system to really grasp everything, you really would have to have the perfect set of data structured preferably uh, and then smart technology or analytics or, or those kind of things that can bring it all together. But at the end right. of the day, keep in mind, a lot of that is after the fact, because once the LC has been, it, it's an after the fact type of thing, right? At the time of payment, most banks don't stop the payment because they have to fulfill the terms of that letter of credit application and affect the payment. So it really becomes, do you know the parties? Do you know your customer? Do you know your customer's customers? And then do you know the other banks that are involved in the transaction and, and just... Um... Uh, uh, but yeah, I have, so we have only uh, five minutes left. Um, I think we should go to the famous last words uh, from each of you. Um, I, I'm, I'm maybe introducing uh, the last five minutes with uh, some provoking statements um, um, here. Uh, because I think, uh, first of all, um, um, I'm a fan of uh, system dynamics approach. 
uh, that is saying that complexity can only be handled through complexity. So there is no easy way to um, handle complex problems. Uh, that's all. So all these uh, um, easy life uh, uh, gurus um, might be might have their fans, but it's not working in trade finance. It's not working in AML at all. Um, but you mentioned uh, human intelligence, and I say uh, one of the answers uh, to handle. Uh, um, the flow of information, the unstructured data that you need, the screening information and so on, is artificial intelligence, uh, meaning using machine learning algorithms or just simple statistics uh, uh, that we know since the 1970s um, that are in place. Uh, they're still good, not because they're 1970s. I was born in uh, 1971, but it's, uh, of course, um, um, also uh, something to say, but uh, it's still in place. It's still valid. It's still good. Just use it. Um, and also use uh, machine learning for that one. Um, so a human intelligence is limited. It's limited, as you mentioned before, Claudia, you said we cannot control all the containers um, that are uh, shipped uh, throughout the world. Uh, you can only pick some of them and then have a human decision-making at the end. But to pick the right ones, uh, we need to, to, to have some technology in place. Um, at least those are my famous last words. And Claudia, you are ladies first, uh, the first one for your uh, last words here as well. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you. I think especially when you're bringing in external data, customs data and those types of things, there's no way a, a human can go through all that, right? So you need assistance through artificial intelligence to really highlight where areas are and things like that. But at the end of the day, to me, it's still about having the right controls in place, having the people well-trained. And I don't just mean the letter of credit people. I also mean the front office, the business people, have them understand better. When they do visits with the customers, that they're uh, vigilant and they look at things, you know. Um, I, I, when I was a relationship banker and we would finance an oven in a factory, I would ask to go to the factory and look at the oven and, and confirm that they are actually manufacturing what they said they were manufacturing. Um, I took that extra step just out of curiosity, not even because of compliance regulations, because I, I was a relationship banker. So making the front office more involved and understanding that it's not about stopping the transactions or or not taking more customers and not increasing the business because the banks that's what they do they process transactions right that's what they are it's about payment movement of money and things like that so to me it would be having the right controls having the right training and just being vigilant um, and bring in technology where it makes sense if, if your volume doesn't justify the technology because of the cost think of other ways where you can um uh at least uh, tune your systems that you have to do a better job of picking things up. Make sure you you, you didn't omit to screen the Swift 700s, right? Uh, or the relevant uh, messages or information. I mean, I had banks that would still do a letter of credit by paper. It wasn't even electronic. It was a paper document. So somebody was inputting that data manually into systems. So Use technology in that way if, if the volumes don't justify a blockchain or other more sophisticated or smart contracts and those things. But um, have the right controls and make sure that your audit is testing in the right areas around this. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Sebastian. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that technology will really uh, have a more important role in the, in the next years. So, uh, why? Uh, because I think machine learning, for instance, Claudia, you mentioned a lot of. Uh, experience that experienced people need to analyze things uh, machine learning is very very strong and in, in, in identifying uh, hidden layers yeah? so you don't not suddenly understand what's going on you're just having kind of uh, uh, third sense uh, or sixth sense to to, to, to but you need it, the volume uh, for that you need the volume yeah, of course. yeah but yeah but you have the volume you want to digitalize the more, yep. more volume you have yeah and then technology is really uh, developing fast so uh, yes, right now it's uh, maybe not perfect, but uh, yeah, if you look back, yeah, how, how fast the uh, technology uh, develops, it will definitely be uh, a game changer. And this is combined with uh, DLT technology and certain certain applications that uh, yeah, just help to get an, yeah, a kind of yeah, uh, additional layer to, to uh, a reliable source of information. Um, I think this will be really, really important, and not just because I'm a technologist, but just yeah, this is how technology develops in general. Yeah. So um, yeah. 
Ja. Yeah. Okay, good, great. Uh, Uwe. Yeah, I think, uh, Dirk, thank you. Yeah, I think it is important yeah, to implement inside the bank a culture to understand what is trade finance, what does it mean, where are the risks, and then you have to analyze your risk, and then you have to fight for budget and resources to do it more efficient, to be compliant, because at least yeah, there are a lot of questions about those things. It makes sense to have an independent system to, trade, uh, to check trade finance, yeah, the contracts and so on, but as well include in those systems the normal transactions of the client, and then you are able to create complex rules. You are able uh, to cover most of the red flag indicators. It will give you a warning. Yeah, so it's not an early warning. Yeah, but it is possible for you as a banker to understand those things. Yeah, to investigate and in case if it is necessary to report to the authorities mm -hmm. to avoid any kind of uh, risk to lose your reputation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, just. First of all, I was always wondering, uh, because we we're always talking about MT messages, uh, so SWIFT messages, um, as SWIFT would be the only system in the world. And due to uh, the sanction topics, we are focusing, I guess, too less also on SIPs, for example, so the Chinese payment system and others. So we, we, we need to include them in those discussions as well. And I think there are tons of more um, points for discussions about red flags, about um, how to set up a system, uh, triggering the right alerts. And, and maybe um, and that's because we uh, received some very detailed questions about MT720 uh, messages, um, about specific uh, um, 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 regulations um, and, and documents. Um, um, some of the topics are covered in uh, uh, the presentation that is available for download anyway. Well, feel free to contact us. Um, so the speaker contacts um, are, are, are shown at least in the last page of the um, presentation as well. I just sent the, the, the questions and um, I assume that we all are um, happy to, to answer them if possible. Um, um, but uh, please um, understand that we cannot deep dive into um, very specific uh, transaction types um, um, and, and because otherwise we would have a one hour discussion only for that one. We can do this also, and maybe uh, we, we have to sit together um, and think about um, a, a second uh, discussion around about this uh, trade based money laundering. Because it's, as we mentioned, it's one hour um, gun like nothing um, and covered, yeah, more or less only a, a small spot out of the whole um, topic. Um, so thank you, uh, Claudia, Sebastian, Uwe, for your time uh, for the discussion. Um, and um, thank you all uh, who were listening um, now or maybe later um, um, on this um, uh, recording here. Um, just follow us, um, hashtag Rethink Compliance or um, MSG Rethink Compliance. Um, you'll find us um, in LinkedIn, you'll find us on the website. Um, feel free to contact us and follow us. Thank you all and have a nice evening or a good morning wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.